Hey, good morning, y'all. I'm Ben with Bates Nursery Botanical Boot Camp. Um, you know, we're here early in the morning. We don't expect a ton of people in here, but we're going to wait for a few minutes before we get started. Um, today, we're talking about shade plants, and because of the scope of shade plants, we're going to kind of stick with annuals and perennials, <clears throat> things that are smaller or softer than a shrub or a tree today. And we can definitely do a whole topic on uh, shade shrubs and trees in another time. So um, we're just going to wait for a few more minutes and see if anyone else comes in. And then we'll get started on shade plants, uh, perennial and annual edition. Um, this morning we're talking about shade plants, perennials and annuals. Um, most of my experience is with perennials. Um, I'll be honest, personally, I don't do a whole lot of annual shade plants planting um, but I've definitely done some uh, in other gardens and we'll kind of touch on those first uh, our annual selection is definitely kind of starting to run down a little bit because our uh, warm season annuals are kind of halfway through their season uh, and here in probably three months or so we'll probably start thinking about planting cool season annuals but we can still touch on some things that we have some things still look good um, and some things are really just starting to take off in the annuals in the shade um, so i've just got a few right here kind of hidden and we'll kind of hold them up we talk about the annuals um, again annual meaning you know we plant it once typically it's going to live for one season four to six months and then we're going to rip it out replace it or cut it back um, these are always more affordable typically we're going to plant these in massings to get that effect so um, first i have impatience uh, most people are, are familiar with just kind of your typical impatience here's a four pack of pink uh, what color is this pink punch um, and, and that's a pretty popular color in annuals. We get a lot of these punch collections with pinks and reds and whites. Um, kind of a lower medium. I want to say these get probably a foot or so in the shade, 10 inches tall. Um, you know, these I'd probably be planting six inches apart. Good performers in the shade. Um, a good kind of hint that this is going to be good in the shade are these darker green leaves typically a broader leaf um, just meaning it can handle that lack of sunlight we have a new guinea impatient which i really kind of prefer the look of a new guinea impatient these can handle a little more sun than shade um, but definitely can handle the shade they tend to have a sturdier leaf uh, with fewer leaf disease problems um, so they can hold up a little better especially in drought uh, but yeah this is a new guinea impatient what is this one clockwork red um, i think red red new guinea impatients in a bed they get a little bit taller but they can really fill out in massing um, the other shade annuals we have are begonias um, which most people are fairly familiar with begonias um, a lot of people keep them in their house year round um, so we have some um, bronze leaf begonias, um, and these are going to do pretty well in shade. They could take a little bit of sun. Um, there's green leaf begonias, and all of these kind of have a nice waxy coating on the leaf, which is really appealing visually, uh, makes a really nice massing, prolific bloomer. Um, begonias are just a great option, especially for a, a deep shade area. Um, and I talked about begonias, you know, being used as uh, indoor plants. You know, you will see some of these fancier um, rec style begonias. There's all sorts of these um, uh, really nice, call them uh, fancier begonia. And, and you could keep these year round if you really wanted to. Um, they look great if you really want to add some color. Uh, similar to like coleus, you know, you can get a huge range of color, except these are going to sit lower. Um, I don't have any coleus on the table. We're, we're getting a little bit low on that, but coleus is also another um, pretty good annual for shade. Some are more for sun, but um, that's something that most people plant at the beginning of summer. And lastly, I have geranium. Um, so geranium, another great plant. I really like the foliage of this plant and how different it is. Uh, you kind of have the crinkle leaves on the geranium, really firm stems, and the blooms on clusters. So um, most of these plants come in a variety of warm colors, pinks, reds, whites, uh, as well as a lot of kind of orange tones. Uh, a lot of times we do not get our blues and purples out of these shade annuals and usually it's going to be on the warm spectrum um, so yeah those are the shade annuals like i said i'm sure there's plenty more feel free to ask any questions if y'all need to 
no information or an option you're thinking about for a shade annual. Um, <clears throat> we will probably be switching over to cool season here once we get to the end of summer, probably in September for a, for a different selection. Okay, so we're gonna switch gears to shade uh, perennials. And I should probably, I should have said this at the beginning, when we're talking shade, um, you know, classifying what is shade, we're really talking less than six hours of sun a day. Um, typically deep shade, we're looking at less than three hours. Um, if this area is completely under shade trees, we would probably call that deep shade or part shade if it's filtered all day. So um, we're looking in the three to six hour range, maybe a little less for some of these plants to consider it shade. Um, of course, dry shade is a little different. Uh, at my house personally, I have very dry shade. Uh, so that means we have to be a little bit careful about what I'm selecting. Um, ferns are a little bit higher maintenance in my dry shade. I have to go out of my way to water them. So um, being a little bit cognizant, and I'll try to mention ones that I know are a little more drought tolerant, um, is something to think about in the shade because you may need to water a little more for some of these more tender plants like hosta. Um, Lenten rose, until it gets established, can be a little bit sensitive to the heat and the drought. So, all right, we'll, we'll just get started. Um, we'll kind of go with the more common perennials that most people are familiar with, uh, namely hostas. <laughs> most people are very familiar with hosta. There are so many varieties, I, I can barely touch on them today. Um, I've got two of the more popular varieties, and we'll kind of pull these front and center. Um, Hostas can really go in part sun. Some of them, like some in substance, can really go in, in full sun. Um, and a lot of them can handle deep shade. And it really depends variety to variety. I have found that the ones with these thicker, um, denser leaves, more pronounced ridges, seem to handle the sun um, a little bit better. It's just a sturdier plant. And this one's a Bequa. This is Drinking Gordon. I tried to find one with water in it this morning. I think all the water's left. Um, but hosta really have a lot of components to add to your garden. It's texture, it's color. Um, a lot of times they will hold water on their leaves a certain way and you'll get a glisten. And this one is made to hold water as a cup. So in the morning you can come out and get dew in these leaves. So you get another aspect of this plant. Um, they will throw bloom stalks on. Let's see if y'all can see this one. Uh, so this is guacamole. This is the other one I've brought. So another very common, very popular old-fashioned uh, hosta. Um, guacamole has these really nice broad leaves with a light green and a dark green fringe. Big blooms. Um, this is kind of on the taller side. You know, I'd expect this bloom stalk to maybe get up to three feet. Um, and then the Abiqua drinking gourd, you know, I think this is probably up to a two foot hosta. Um, there's some hostas that get a lot bigger. There's some like mouse ears that stay very, very small. So hosta, definitely a versatile plant in the shade perennial garden. Um, probably the one downside to these, or maybe two if you look at it right, is they can crash a little bit early in the fall. Um, most people cut them back when they crash. It's not difficult, but if you have a lot of hosta, it can be a little bit of a maintenance thing in the fall to keep them looking good. Um, and then a lot of that crashing foliage, you know, we get pathways for slugs. Slugs can be a problem with hosta. Luckily, we have ways of treating that um, but those are probably the, the two main downsides of hosta. Otherwise, a real versatile shade plant. Um, every shade of green you could imagine, white, so great options for adding color. And contrast, like you can see this display up here, we have a lot of greens, um, but different tones of green, which uh, we get a lot of in the shade, just due to reduced bloom potential. Okay, so those are hostas. Um, again, you know, folks collect hosta, so there's a lot to go into there. Uh, we usually carry quite a few varieties. Um, ferns, kind of something that I use uh, personally a little more in the garden. Um, so we have kind of three ferns that I'm a little more familiar with here. Uh, and we'll kind of pull these. So Christmas fern, a couple of evergreen ferns. And ferns generally can be very shade tolerant. So that deep shade location, these are gonna be uh, really prime for. Uh, a moist, well-draining location, emphasis on moist. Uh, if ferns dry out in the summer, you'll see a lot of crashing, a lot of browning. If you can keep it moist, have a lot of uh, leaf matter or mulch in that area, a fern is really gonna like that. Um, so here on my left, you're right, uh, I have a Christmas fern. 
So this is polystichium. This is one of the evergreen ferns, native. You'll see this growing in the woodlands. It's usually very low to the ground. They kind of spread out. Uh, very unassuming texture, but added into an open shade landscape, it can really give it this cool naturalized look. Uh, so that's Christmas fern, an evergreen fern. And the one that I grow a lot of, and it's a very popular one, is autumn fern. Um, so autumn fern gets its name for this gold-colored foliage. See if I can find it here. So kind of this gold, this gold-colored foliage. This is another evergreen fern. Um, again, the evergreen really depends on the moistness of the soil and how much you can maintain that. And I've seen these get more tall than wide. So two feet tall, two foot wide, maybe three foot tall, three foot wide. Um, Really nice for texture, really nice for evergreen color, um, giving you that kind of orange that's really missing uh, in the shade garden. Great in massing, great on kind of borders. And then the last one I have here, see if I don't bump the microphone, is a painted fern, um, which just for color contrast and texture, you know, this is a Japanese fern, I do believe we call it. Uh, this one's regal red but Ethereum. Um, so this is a Japanese painted fern. These are actually notoriously a little more drought tolerant than other ferns. You know, they have this very kind of coarse, crinkled, um, parsley-like texture, I guess you could call it. Um, and then they kind of have, sometimes it doesn't show up well on camera, but they have a white uh, inside to that and a dark margin, which really shows up in a shade garden. Um, I found in the shade garden using yellows and whites can really give you the sense of a draw into that space. And this is a great one for that. Um, maybe paired with, we have this Japanese forest grass over here we'll talk about in a second. Great combination for that court kind of oriental um, flowy shade garden. Okay, what else do I have? I have a couple tall ones over here. Um, I won't be able to pick these guys up. But kind of in front here, I have a uh, picanthium. Uh, mountain mint and that's one that I've had a lot of luck with this year it seems very drought tolerant uh, this is one that if you're all about the pollinators uh, the bees the butterflies it's a big one um, so a native with leaves that are fragrant uh, similar to like a spearmint and then what I really like is they get this see if I can get it to where it looks like it. You get this kind of a gray foliage on the surface before it blooms. Kind of an unassuming bloom, um, but I think in massing, you can really see that sheeny gray look that sits at about two to three feet. And that's really kind of neat for that shade garden. Um, height, they seem to have very sturdy stems. And again, great for pollinators in the shade. And that's mountain mint. Uh, behind it, we have cast iron plant. So this is another plant that, uh, what did we talk about earlier? The begonia that does well in shade, but also gets used as an indoor plant occasionally. So this is one of those plants that kind of is a blurred line between um, a shade annual and an indoor tropical. So you see it used as both, um, but it is very tough. Just like it na its name says, cast iron plant is very resilient. Um, it'll hold these big tropical leaves with wind, with brushing against it. Um, fairly trouble-free, other than the frost that will likely kill it in our area every year. Um, so again, that's cast iron plant here. We'll, we'll pull it out here so y'all can see the stems. Um, Kind of neat for the middle back of a bed as like a, ver uh, a vertical filler. <clears throat> you know, you could use it in a container in the shade. Uh, this thing will show you when it's dry. Um, and you probably want to keep it on the moisture side versus dry. But that's cast iron plant. I mean, as far as a tropical texture, uh, that is really one of the best for shade. Apart from elephant ear. So I have Colocasia hidden over here. And this is a small one. You know, a lot of people are familiar with the big big one, Jack's Giant. Um, there are Korean elephant ears, uh, alocasia, uh, but these are considered annual. Sometimes they're perennials. It's a bulb. Um, I've had about 50% loss year to year on these in the ground. Another one that takes a, a quite a bit of water. You do want to keep it moist to keep these looking good. Um, but really a showy plant. I mean, Jack's giant will get three foot tall and it'll have leaves that are, you know, 
uh, two feet across. So elephant ear, great for texture, tropical. Usually we'll use it on like the corners, middle back of beds to kind of give you that pop or that kind of screen to put uh, flowering annuals in front of. Um, again, that's Colocasia elephant ear. A lot of people plant these by bulbs and it's um, a very reliable uh, propagator uh, through, through the bulb. Um, really, really easy plant, again, on the moist side. And again, another plant that is also a tropical. Some people are able to get these to overwinter in their house or at least bring the bulb into the garage. So that's elephant ear, cool for that tropical shade garden. It might have been coming back reliably for yeah, well, quite I, a while. I had about two years of elephant ear that came back, and it, it was Jack's Giant. And I've only got one this year, so whether it was drought, maybe it dried out this spring, maybe it got too cold in the winter, um, but I had one out of three survive this past year. It's kind of hit or miss, but they're very affordable. They grow quick, so if you have to replace it, typically not a big deal. All right, a uh, couple other plants we have here going to the other side. Um, up front, I'll go ahead and talk about a stilby. Um, this was our own Austin Lowen's pick. And a stilby is an awesome one. Uh, there's some bright red astilbies, pink astilbies, white astilbies. Um, prop it up a little bit. Let's see if I can get there. There you go. Okay, so that's a stilby. Um, really great for a rugged shade garden plant. I mean, as far as drought tolerance, I think this is probably going to be way up there as far as drought tolerance. It does spread a little bit, but it is pretty tidy and compact. You can deadhead the blooms to make it look better, um, but a stilby is a great low kind of front or mid of a shade bed, just massing for color. Um, long lasting bloom typically all through the summer, maybe into fall a little bit. Uh, they all just about have that dark green fringed foliage, which I do like that kind of coarse fringe on it. You know, it, it does kind of mix with this fern. So, you know, maybe don't plant it next to a fern, maybe have it next to something more like heuchera with a coarse leaf or next to your hosta with a coarse leaf. I think it would go great with. Um, and there's some other plants similar to that. Anemone uh, looks very similar, has a similar texture. Anemone tends to spread a little more and has this kind of seed head that gives it another season. I just don't have an anemone in here today. Um, but that's a stilby, great one, staff pick, um, very rugged for the shade garden. And behind it, one of my favorite is heuchera. Just as far as its resilience, uh, it tends to keep leaves up through the winter, so you do get some color. Um, but the palette of color on heuchera is just amazing. So we get greens, purples, we get some silver leafed ones. Uh, and commonly this is called coral bells. And let me see what varieties you have here. So the lime green, lemon love, um, it's a fairly common one. Let's see, midnight rose. And what I like about Midnight Rose, I don't know if you can really see it, this does have a speckling to the leaf, so it just adds another kind of dimension. You can see the, the speckling up here. Um, real neat, you know, there's probably 25, 30 varieties that we have, all different colors. Um, really great to be used as a color palette through the shade garden. So I like to use these middle of the bed and then across the shade garden to give you some continuity. Um, just use it as a balancer for the color in that bed. You know, I'm kind of partial to the greens, the lime greens, to contrast with dark leaf plants, um, but there's a lot of options out there. Fairly tough and tolerant and generally under two feet, usually two by two. Some varieties can get a little bigger, but they are easy to prune. Um, again, that's heuchera, coral bells. And then I do have a heucherella back here. I'll pull it to the front. Um, heucherella. Uh, also known as foamy bells. Let me see. I believe this one has an interesting name. Yeah, this one's buttered rum. Doesn't that make you all thirsty here in the morning? Uh, oh, yeah. Buttered rum. <laughs> uh, and this kind of does have that caramel. There is a heuchera coral bell called caramel that's got a similar color. Um, but foamy bells is a little more sensitive, so this really would like a deeper shade of moisture soil. It's got a finer foliage and a smaller bloom on a little short panicle. So this is kind of nice for um, a low part of a shade garden, almost 
almost ground cover esque. So they usually sit real low and have little um, foamy bells on top of them. So that's Hucarella, very similar to coral bells, um, a little more petite, a little more sensitive, but still worth a mention. All right, so I've got Bernera here. We actually just got some Bernera in yesterday and they look really good. Uh, this is Jack, Di Jack of Diamonds. And this is uh, great for texture. Again, it, it seems like in shade, color, and texture are everything just because of reduced bloom potential. Um, but this thing has a great silvery color. I mean, it actually has a sheen to it. Um, again, that's Bernera, kind of a low, oh, what are they going to say the height on these are? Yeah, two, two, two and a half feet. So a nice little tidy, real similar to our coral bells in use. Um, but just for that silver white contrast, um, you know, this is kind of interesting with textures and colors that contrast with it or probably with like a dark color. Oh, like that. You know, so th this will go really well, and you can use that kind of white center across your shade garden. Um, really neat combination plant. Okay, we're getting close to the end of this table here. Uh, Lenten rose. This is something that we hear a lot more in spring, um, but it is an evergreen perennial. Um, you know, it's almost into the realm of herbaceous, herbaceous shrub. Um, no blooms on this right now. Typically, it's going to bloom... Um, through winter into spring and then the blooms will kind of peter out the beginning of summer uh, but Lenten rose or hellebore um, is a really neat old-fashioned plant they tend to form massings year after year I usually see them in maybe a three to four foot wide massing one to two feet tall a great rugged spiny texture something we usually only see in shrubs like uh, fragrant tea olive or like holly um, so you can kind of get that texture with an herbaceous perennial. Um, the benefit to that is you can lose some leaves and it can rejuvenate and it can really be a little more tolerant once established. Again, that's Lenten Rose. I wish I had some blooms to show y'all because um, the blooms are quite neat. They're very um, constructed and firm, so they last a long time. A and it is evergreen, so this thing will stick around in your garden. I mean, you can see it against this, this green heuchera. Um, you know, put this with lighter colored plants and it can really become like a backdrop um, or something to contrast with those. And, and very tough once established. Usually by year two or three, you're good to go with uh, Lenten Rose. Okay, a couple grasses. Uh, I guess grasses, I should say a sedge. So there are some options if you want a grass texture and, and we're not really talking about ground covers. Um, liriopes, monkey grass, vines, that sort of thing. Um, but this is a clumping grass, similar to liriope. And this is a sedge, this is uh, Everglow, part of this Ever Sedge collection. Uh, but the cool thing about sedge is you're gonna have this very firm, um, really an evergreen foliage. You'll probably need to trim this from season to season to clean it up. Um, but great for that grass texture in the, in the shade. Um, there's a lot of sedges that spread and lay over. Um, there's native sedges. Just a great option for color. This one has variegated leaves, so it's got this kind of white fringe. Some of these are bright yellow. Uh, some of them are almost white altogether. Uh, some of them are almost dark purple. So um, sedge, another one of those plants, texture, color, we can play with to kind of take the place of some blooms in the shade. So even though we do like our blooms, you know, this thing can really make other plants pop. You know, coarse leaf, coral bell next to this grass, you know, both of these are amplified. And especially in the shade, it allows us to kind of um, visually see each of these plants because they're contrasting with each other. Speaking of texture, so this is Japanese forest grass. Um, really great, especially for a deep shade location. So we can make a little room here. Um, Japanese forest grass, and it's really, and, and I'll let y'all see the picture here on the tag. Really, it just needs to, whoop. <laughs> it just needs to kind of get established and it forms this, um, 
massing, like yellow massing there. Um, That's as close as I can get. Uh, then. Yeah, Sorry. we're probably not going to see it, but y'all, y'all can see pictures of Japanese forest grass established. It's fairly common in Japanese gardens. Um, you know, they look a little bit sparse in these pots, but once you get them in the ground and massing, they form literally like a mat of yellow frilly foliage that's great for putting under Japanese maples, under shade trees. Um, really just good for this texture element. Um, again, it's very fine. You can see it with the Japanese painted fern in front of it. Um, just for that delicate, oriental style garden um, Japanese forest grass is a great one um, and like I said it's really if you look at pictures of these mature in gardens and massing um, it's just a really cool sight to behold um, it almost has the effect of flowing water when you see it in a landscape so um, really neat for texture uh, again this is a grass I believe the species is uh, Hakanakloa so one of those that's hard to forget. Again, Hakanakloa, Japanese forest grass, just another good shade perennial. And that's most of what I have on the table. Again, there are quite a few others. Um, I meant to grab a geranium. Um, so we do have uh, geraniums. Roseanne is something we're very familiar with around here. That does give you blooms for the shade. Uh, I think I did have, I think there's another plant hiding up here. Ah, this was another staff pick. Sorry, y'all, I almost forgot about this one. Uh, Epimedium. Uh, so this is kind of a really interesting and a textural thing. So there's spines all over this. And I wanted to find one that was blooming, and that's why I picked this one. This is a very, very unique bloom on it, Epimedium. Um, similar, you could say, to Columbine or some of those other shade annuals that bloom in the spring but it's got a very delicate um, bloom and they come in different colors whites yellows i think there's some in the pink spectrum uh, there's one called sandy claws that we get um, with kind of that that christmas reference but it's got these claws on the leaves and it's kind of a low spreading perennial uh, with just an extremely interesting texture interesting bloom and very tough and tolerant which you know with the heat we've been having um, that's a good option to have. So this is Epimedium, um, kind of a staff pick by our own Michelle. And that's also a really awesome one. It's nice to catch them in bloom because it's a really interesting, unique bloom. Um, you just don't see a lot of. Okay, now I think I got everything on the table. All right. And like I said, there, there's a lot of other flowering shade plants. Um, you know, we could probably go on all day for that, so feel free to ask us questions or if, if there's things you're interested in, um, run it by us. So, yeah, if anyone has any questions, just uh, let us know. Teresa on Facebook asks the question, how large does one Japanese forest grass plant get? They are a slow spreader. Typically, they're not going to get above a couple feet whenever they're massing. I'm not sure what they're... Monrovia is going to say that the size is on them. Um, yeah, 18 inch tall and wide. You know, typically people are going to plant these about a foot or two apart um, for that massing. I think they can slowly get larger, but yeah, I would expect a foot and a half by a foot and a half, maybe two foot um, on this plant, and then it's going to start laying over. So, you know, if you're going to do massing or somewhat of an edging, I'd probably plant these a foot, foot and a half apart two feet if you want a little bit of independence so yep that looks to be about it ben uh take it away yeah yeah um yeah this is exciting i uh specialize a lot in sh in shrubs and trees so you know this is kind of getting me exciting I, I can't wait to talk about some shade trees and shrubs and definitely if if y'all want to talk about any of these plants come in and pick our brain um, you know, we all love to explore new options and, and find new ways of doing things with you and, and things we haven't thought of and things we've tried and true before. So, um, these are really fun plants to play around with and, and move around in your garden. Um, 
Again, it's hot and sunny, so just make sure you water your plants when you get them in the ground. I just recently put a shade tarp, which y'all will probably see whenever we come take a look at my personal garden tomorrow. Um, I have put up a fake tree or shade tarp over my shade plants just because they have getting seared. So, um, you know, check your environment. If it gets a little sunny, do whatever you can to protect your shade plants. Uh, because they're just going to keep doing well, especially if you get them through this heat in the summer. So um, thank you all for letting me talk with you all about shade plants. Have a good one.